secret service. Did you know you're in the secret service? I hope you're not, because we need to be telling it. In today's message, we're going to get to our scripture in Matthew just a little bit. We'll read where Jesus teaches that we're not to make a show of our service to him. Thus, the title, Secret Service. He reveals those who put on a big display to garner the attention of others to their religious acts as wrong. And to emphasize his point, he tells us to not let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. This is some more of a teaching example of Jesus because uh, that's basically an uh, impossibility. It's a hyperbole, an exaggeration, just to make a point of how serious he is about this, that when we worship God, we do it from our heart. We do it to honor him, not for other people to say, oh, wow, how religious they are or how pious they are. We should not go to God in that aspect. And I know some who carry it so far, and it's within each person's right to do that, that not to want to pray in public. I don't really think that's what Jesus is getting to. There's, there's power. There's, a, there, there's something special about God's people lifting their hearts and prayers together as someone leads us in prayer. But even that could be done with a show, and so we don't want to do that. But that doesn't mean we can't take stock of what's being done. As an individual, we need to not make a show of what we're doing. But also as a church, we don't want to take too much pride in things that are going on. But it is good for us to examine and evaluate and to know what's happening within our body. And so I'm going to talk about some of that today as we look in our scripture we're not a large church, and COVID and other events have made us not as large as the church once was. But that doesn't mean that we're not actively engaged in Christian education and ministry of service acts and telling God's word. You know, as you look around, some of you who, I've been here two years now, and many of you have been here much, much longer, but even just two years ago, you had just gotten the new roof on. And before that, the, the basement was flooding, had a nice little swimming pool down there, from what I understand, or a wading pool. That's dried up and gone. The walls were crumbling from water damage and ugly. This entrance here couldn't be used for safety uh, concerns. And those kind of physical improvements that we've seen are easy to see. We sit here now in a comfortable, dry place. There's no smell of mustiness or moldiness. The walls are beautiful. And it's a delight to host something like the funeral service, the memorial service yesterday, because we know that uh, the, the church looks good inside. The fellowship hall, if you can remember those of some of you, that carpet down there and how stained it was. Love stains from all the food we fed the children, but stained just the same. And now we have the hardwood floor that's easy to clean. So we can see all those things. And soon you're going to see new carpet in here and new pews covering up, taking rid of the stains that are on the pews, the tattered corners, the worn fabric. It'll be a different appearance. Those are easy to see. But that doesn't reflect all that's happening at your church. The improvements are tools to assist us in presenting the gospel to our community. And that's our task. That's our mission. That's why God planted a church here in Campbellsburg and other churches is to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to our community. And so these places where we sit are just a... a tool, as I mentioned, in order to help us listen, to be engaged, to be active. This week I've been focusing, thinking about the ministries, kind of uh, reminiscing, evaluating, looking at what goes on here, and there's some that can easily go unnoticed, especially if 
Sunday morning at 11 to 12 is your main exposure to our church, there are other good things going on. And one of them is our benevolence fund. We maintain that. Many of you give directly to it. We don't talk about it because it's dealing with individuals who call for help, and we don't want to publicize that. But we've helped many, many people. And just this church year alone, from October to now, we've assisted them to the tune of $2,000, paying utility bills, water bills, helping out with rent, getting food, these kind of things that the church is involved in. And again, you support that, and that's taken care of quietly, not secretly, but quietly. We are represented. We're involved with other churches, working together on the backpack ministry. Our church has a representative that is there regularly getting supplies, providing them, putting together backpacks for children in our community. And not just food, they, there is food in there, but also supplies for school and, and other things that they need. And so that's another ministry that the churches in our town are sharing together to care for others. But you wouldn't see that if you're not part of it or not aware of it. Most of you are aware that at Christmas we collect the uh, goods and put them in shoe boxes that go around the world, literally, to try to give children in uh, third world countries, many of them poor who would never get a gift, something special, and, and of course, along with that, the gospel is told to them, and they're told why they're receiving a gift, and that's because we're emulating the free gift of Jesus Christ, our Savior. This year, we celebrated 26 years of Team Kid, 26 years of inviting the children of our community to come here for a time of Bible learning, of crafts, of fellowship, and of food off and on, and snacks. And people are involved in that, supplying that. We've completed our second year of team youth that was added on, and, and, and the fruit we've seen from that is we've seen three of those youth acknowledge their faith in Jesus Christ and be baptized. We've, we've celebrated in that. Our children's director since March has been looking at some new curriculum that she's excited about, and, and the deacons and, uh, approved the purchase of that this, this uh, past week that we're going to start. It's called Hi-Fi, and it's a high-energy, VBS-style type uh, Bible, Bible school setting with a lot of just energy and up that'll grab the kids, digital videos, things that are new to us and maybe not appeal to us, but it, it attracts and speaks to the children, and we're trying to reach them for Christ. We're trying to teach them about Him and have them develop a life in Him. So that's one thing that'll be coming up this school year. This summer, with those that have, uh, like I said, acknowledged Christ and been baptized. I've invited them every Wednesday to come to a Bible study with me. And, and all four of them, there's, there's four of our youth, three who have been baptized, have participated at one time or another in that study. And we've begun with some very basic Bible study. Your salvation, talking about salvation, salvation in your past life, salvation in your present life, salvation in your future life, looking up scriptures, and for some of these, the Bible is new to them, and they, they aren't used to looking up scriptures like we are. And so we take our time patiently to help them as they learn their Bible and learn to find in God's Word what they can read and learn about. For years, you ladies have met on Tuesday morning in Bible study. Last summer, or last year, a lot of the time, they talked about, they looked at Revelation, learning about Revelation, and then in the spring, Esther. But it's more than just studying the Bible or watching a video. The ladies take time to 
write in cards. They work together. It's really a neat experience to watch them as each one has a, an assignment or something they do and preparing the cards to send out to those who have a birthday, who have an anniversary, or to those who have suffered a loss or struggling with the illness, sending a card to let them know they're not forgotten, that they're taken care of, that they're loved, and someone knows and prays for them. This spring, we added a Tuesday evening Bible study. We had some younger women who worked during the day, wanted to do Bible study, and so we started meeting on Tuesday evenings, and we had a, a good turnout for that. In both groups, we studied the book of Esther. Time doesn't permit me to mention all the activities individually, but we've had movie nights, some aimed specifically at the youth, and always with the sharing of the gospel to let them, and, and we've seen that fruit. We've taken trips this summer, field trips to different attractions. A bunch of us last Saturday went to the Ark of the Covenant, and, and uh, several, when I asked them what impressed them, what struck them about it, shared with me that first thing, like it did me, is when you walk up and it just towers above you. I don't think you can imagine how big the Ark is until you see it. And then you go inside and see the beams that were hewn and you can wonder, I mean, we have machines to do it. You can wonder, no wonder it took Noah 100 plus years to put that ship together because they had to do it all by hand. We've done things like that. We've enjoyed concerts by local artists and the organ and piano concert we had in the spring with John Ball and Martha Tollefson was a high moment for many of us to hear the glorious pipes ring out and the piano played. We've had some of those good times. Several members rotate leading our children's church that have already left for morning worship with a time they don't just go and play. They're going with a Bible lesson at their age level to learn about Jesus Christ. So our church, your church, is actively involved in sharing Jesus Christ in word and deed with the people of our community and via our live stream broadcast across our nation and literally around the world. I mentioned our Tuesday Bible studies and that we studied Esther this last spring. And in that study, we read how Esther was chosen as the, uh, along with other young women in the, in the empire to come to, the, to uh, the capital city to be groomed to become a consort of the king they, they uh, did everything about makeup and dressing and how to talk, how to act, how to be before the king. They were coached and prepared in order to teach them how to impress and please the king. And then, one by one, they were brought before the king in consideration of becoming his bride and the future queen. That book of Esther is a foreshadowing of the bride of Christ, the church. The church consists of those who have accepted Jesus' redemptive work on their behalf. And like Esther, each one of you was chosen for the king's service. Jesus is recorded in John 15, 16 to say, you did not choose me, but I chose you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. So Jesus picked you. And like Esther, each one of the chosen was prepared for service to the king. One verse I chose, picked out for that is Ephesians 4, 11, 13, which tells us, so Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ could be built up or edified until we all reach unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We were gathered, we are gathered here. God's put us together. He's given you leaders to equip you to prepare you for that service to the king. 
And then finally, like Esther, one day, we're going to be ushered into the presence of the Almighty King, God, our King. We're going to be His bride. And we're going to dwell with Him in the kingdom forever. We read in Revelation 19, 7, Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and His bride, which is the church, has made herself ready. And so on that day, Jesus is going to present you to the king. So you are picked, you are prepared, and you will be presented. In our study in these past weeks of the Sermon on the Mount, it is a study of Jesus preparing his people that he's picked to be presented to the king. He's teaching the people how they need to live, how they need to be godly, what they need to do in their lives, and how we need to, uh, that ugly six-letter word, change in order to glorify our King, in order to please Him. And that is Matthew 6, 1 through 18, our text today. And we're just going to look at some highlights of those texts because 18 verses is a bit long. But starting in uh, chat, chat verse 1, of chapter 6, Jesus starts out, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue or on the streets to be honored by men. Now, down to verse 16. When you fast, do not look somber as hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. Verse, uh, I skipped one. Verse 5, but when you pray, do not be like hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward. In all of those instances when Jesus is teaching that, he doesn't say if. He says when you give, when you pray, when you fast. These are things that he expects his people to do. But when we do those things, We're not to do it with show. We're just supposed to give it humbly, gratefully, meekfully to the service of God so that he can take that and multiply in order to help those in our community. And those three actions, that's so important that we pick out that he said, when, not if. We are expected to do those things These three actions in conjunction with all of Jesus' teaching were given to prepare us in godliness. God wants us to be like him, to emulate him. Jesus is teaching us how to do that. Everything we do or say is measured by what God sees of our heart, not visible action. We can do things before each other and we can impress each other with Uh, with what we give, with what we do, but that's not what God is looking at. And certainly some things when we're doing these ministries, they are visible. You can see them, and they're not hidden, but there's an attitude difference here of why. And God is evaluating that attitude. Is it from a worshipful heart obeying him, or is it to gain the glory of man? And God and Jesus teaches in this passage, you're going to be rewarded. But if you are seeking the reward of the praise of men, you will have received your reward and you won't receive the reward of God in heaven. If we do it humbly with the Spirit and maybe nobody knows the gifts we've done, the work we've done, that's okay because our Father in heaven sees us and he's going to reward us as no one else can. And that's what we need to seek. Luke 6.38, Jesus says, 
Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Important concept there. The picture there is of a woman going to the market to get grain, and they would have an apron on, of course, to protect their clothes. And often when they went to get the grain, they would hold their apron up, making a bowl out of it. And then the vendor would pour the grain into the apron. And of course, he could bring it below the brim, right up to the brim. But this says when God blesses, it's overrunning. It's measured out, it's, it's shaken together. You know how when we buy a box of cereal or a bag of potato chips, we get a big old bag, you open it up, and the chips are down to here. And you read that little disclaimer on the back, contents may have settled due to shaking and shipment. We go, uh-huh. So God doesn't do that. He doesn't fill what he gives us full of air. It's shaken. It's packed down, and it's overrunning. That's how much he wants to bless. But he gives that warning, that caveat, that as we give, as we use a certain measure, that's how he's going to reward. Jesus said something similar about confessing him. And he says, if you will confess me before men, I will confess you before the Father. But if you do not confess me before men, I will not confess you before the Father. I don't know about you, but I like the idea of Jesus up there at the right hand of the throne of God saying, Father, this is one of mine. He's serving me. He's living for me. He's not perfect. <laughs> the Lord knows he's not perfect. But he's trying, just like King David was said to have a whole heart for God. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, Paul writes, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. If you're wanting to grow a field full of corn, you don't sow seed on just half of it, or you don't put it every other row. If you want that field overflowing with corn or soybeans or whatever you're planting, you put all the seed in that you can. You till the ground. You prepare it ready. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Sows generously will reap generously. And that's true with our lives. So we're expected to give. But in our interpretation of these verses, we shouldn't limit our gift giving financial gifts only. Because the principle holds true for any gift we can make. Of course, that's financially but it can be showing appreciation to others. It seems in our society today, we're hesitant to tell people, you did a good job, you've done well, thank you for what you did for me. It's somehow it's toughness to not express appreciation, and that's a shame. We should be generous in our prayer for others, and of course, for our time, the most valuable commodity we have, perhaps. We are encouraged to give generously in gratitude for what God has given us. Where would we be if it was our time to know the gospel and God said, I'm tired, I haven't got time for this, let's skip the next few. Or I haven't got time to come die on the cross. So we need to give him that time. And we're encouraged to give that generously in gratitude and we trust that God will supply our needs. Philippians 4.19, a great verse that you're familiar with, says, my God will supply all of your needs, how much? According to his glories in heaven or according to the glory of Jesus Christ. No, no one of us, no one of our companies we work for, no check from our government can match the glorious riches of our Heavenly Father. And that's what He promises to give as we live for Him. 
So Jesus says that we should give, pray, and fast to obey and honor God, not ourselves. And our focus here at Campbellsburg Baptist Church, by God's command, is to present the gospel to others. I've shared with you before the statistic that I have heard from our state convention that all of us on our way to church, for every 10 homes we pass, nine homes will not be in a place of worship that day. 90%. Now, there may be another Sunday, but it, it, it varies but 90% of our people at any one time aren't worshiping. That should trouble us. And that is the root of a lot of problems in our neighborhoods. So we're to do this. We're to proclaim the gospel in our community. And to do that, we need to acknowledge a two-pronged approach. And each of those prongs have other areas, but basically two prongs. We need a facility to work from. We need it to be in good repair. We need it to be pleasant in appearance and conducive to worship. Some I've heard said in past, no one said it to me any time that I know while I'm here. But why do we need to do that? We're only there an hour a week. And that's so short-sighted. The mission of Christ is more than an hour a week. And if you've heard statistics, you know that people make an impression within the first 15 seconds. And so while we're not going to encrust things with gold and jewels, it needs to be appealing and in good repair. It reflects what we think of God and the house of worship that he's given us that we care for it. So that's one of the things. And it needs to be when they come, that it is comfortable, the AC's work and they have a good place to sit. They can see, they can hear. That's why the sound enforcement equipment is necessary. That's why these guys volunteer in the back to make sure that everything is operating as best we can. But the other prong of that fork is proclaiming the gospel. We must be engaged in telling others the good news of Jesus Christ by our words and by our actions. Even if we never say anything, we should live so before God that they know there's something different about us. That they may even ask, how can you have joy? You've just just had this great loss in your life and yet you're carrying on. That, That would destroy me. Where do you get that strength? And you'll have the opportunity to share. I'm broken inside, but my Savior buoys me up. He strengthens me because he is living within me. It gives you an opportunity besides your words. Words, as we know, can be cheap. And if words aren't followed by actions, then they fall flat. So we do both as we're preparing to meet the King. We should be preparing others to meet him. To accomplish this requires people to give of their time, effort, and knowledge to reach, to teach. We did those verses for the first part of the year. Pray for laborers. The harvest is white. People need to know the Lord. We've seen that. We're experiencing that. But we need people ready to tell and, and ready to support so those who are more able or more outgoing can tell and get the work done. So our building is a tool to assist us in that endeavor that God has commanded us to do. And so we work to build up the body of Christ and we do that through our words and actions and we do that by having a place that glorifies him and is conducive to that endeavor. There's another benefit to giving, fasting, and praying with a sincere heart to God. When we do these things to win the approval of man, we create tension and turmoil with those around us and within ourselves. That is how envy develops. That is how bitterness develops because we're one up in each other or we're looking down on someone because maybe their gift isn't as big as ours. I've heard many of the old preachers say, not equal giving, 
equals sacrifice. And we were reminded of the widow and her might. And Jesus said, this woman has given more than those who dress fine and give much. God is looking at a sacrificial heart. He's looking at a grateful heart. He's looking for one who gives out of that heart and out of that love for him. And he's not concerned with the amount. He's concerned with the heart behind that, with the devotion behind that. There's a quote by O.S. Hawkins that I have to keep written down. I have to keep handy because I butcher it if I try to remember it. But it's a great one. I live before the audience of one, one being God. Before others, I have nothing to gain, nothing to lose, nothing to prove. On that day, we get called home. Who's going to be standing there if we personify that at the pearly gates? It's not going to be our neighbor that we're trying to one-up. It's not going to be the person we hate or try not to hate. It's not going to be a family member. It's going to be the Lord God Almighty. He's going to be the one who discerns. He's going to be the one that turns to the Father and said, He's one of mine, Lord. Let him in. I stand before the audience of one. Before others, I have nothing to gain, nothing to lose, nothing to prove. And so, in believing that, we obey God and follow his commands because he is able to reward your greater now and in the hereafter than you can imagine. And it is he that will face on that day he calls us heavenward. So Jesus, in this passage in Matthew, chapter 6, through the first 18 verses, assumes when he says, when you give, when you fast, and when you pray, that you're doing it to honor him in full obedience. And that when we do that, he stands ready to bless, to reward, and to keep the wolves away from the door, as it were, or to help us through different trials. And we can praise him and raise him because our God. Thank you.